Some of the stories we are covering, Senegal begins three days of mourning for dozens of road accident victims today, Monday. A tragic accident happened last night near Kafrin, It is a city 200 kilometers from Dakar, and it was two buses, and many people were killed. Liberian authorities seize and investigate a large quantity of military-style weapons. We are here from the lawyer defending Malawi's Embato Anti-Corruption Bureau chief. The exiled former chief justice of Equatorial Guinea breaks his silence about what he calls the international network of kidnappings of political dissidents. I have decided to speak out in order to refute the slanderous purpose against me and to reiterate my repudiation of any action or policy that undermines the rule of law. And the Deputy Secretary General of Eswatini's first female-led political party is abducted and killed. Those stories plus Samson O'Malley sports are coming up on Daybreak Africa. Senegal begins three days of national mourning today, Monday, for victims of a road accident that took place when two buses collided on Sunday. According to Reuters news agency, 38 people died and about 80 are wounded. Ibrahim Anjai is the senior editor at Le Soleil, Senegal's daily newspaper. He tells me the accident was one of the worst in Senegal and that President Macky Sall has promised that his government will do something about road safety. A tragic accident happened last night near Kafrin. It is a city 200 kilometers from Dakar, and it was two buses. There's a lot of persons, and many people were killed, uh, more than 52. Road accidents happen all the time, but uh, how do you compare this particular accident to previous accidents in Senegal? in terms of uh, the number of fatalities, the dead or wounded? It is a very tragic accident, and I think it is the first time we have a very big accident like that. We understand that President Macky Sall has spoken about the accident. What did he have to say? President Macky Sall himself uh, says that we will have a national mourning of three days from tomorrow, Monday to Wednesday. The particularity of this accident is we have many, many, many deaths. And I think it is the first time that we have a, a big number of deaths like this. The president also said that the government will take firm measures on road safety. What can you tell us about road safety in Senegal? The government announced uh, some mesures, and tomorrow we have a council to talk about road safety. But for many people, it looks like uh, sometimes we have in the past many councils for road safety, but the problem is all this measure that has taken never been uh, applied on the field. So we have corruption on the road, we have not good roads sometimes, and uh, we have young drivers, we don't have uh, very good application of all this measure and we need to do uh, effectively application of all these measures that were taken in the past and even the buses or the car are not uh, on good condition we have many 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 problems on this and people are now waiting for 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 very 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 big measure to end all this Ibrahim Njai is a senior editor at Les Soleil, Senegal's daily newspaper. He was speaking with us from Dakar. Liberian police say they are investigating who illegally shipped a large number of military-style weapons to Liberia and for what purpose. Inspector General of Police Colonel Patrick Sudu says the weapons were found in a container shipped through the port of Monrovia by a Liberian residing in the U.S. state of Texas. Colonel Sudu tells me the weapons include 15 assault weapons complete with binoculars. We have an intel concerning this continuum and the Joint Security decided to search the continuum. During our search, we discovered those types of arms. After the discovery, we started to move around to see what we can do to try to apprehend those who are in connection with those arms. We were able to arrest a lady by the name of Barbara Deba. She lives on the Oro. We arrested her during the process of interrogation. 
were able to find a house. The guy who sent this cash arm from the U.S., his house, we call a search warrant. We went to the house along with this girl, Barbara, and we got there. We were able to confiscate about five arms with some ammunition also. The arm was kept in the attic. When we got out of the house, there was a gentleman who was hiding in the, the attic of the house. So we brought him down and we searched the attic and we were able to discover five heavy weapons, fully automatic weapons, and some ammunition. So you said, uh, Inspector General, that. Uh... The weapons came from the United States. Where in the United States did the weapons come from? Well, I cannot say where, but from information gathered, this guy who sent the arm to Liberia, he lives in Texas, and he was in Liberia this gone October. So you say military-style weapons. How many can you say? It? About 15, and yeah, the, all of the rifles have a, a telescope. We have sniper rifles. We have a... AR-15, we had a, a Remington, AK-47, we just leave it. We had M1 Garand also. We had a cleaning material for the entire arm, the same the cleaning materials. They have binoculars, and they had another type of binocular, but it looked like a telescope. So you will find out that most of the weapons are snapper weapons. Could it be these were probably for hunting purpose or what? You don't use military weapons to hunt. In fact, some of the telescopes on the weapon, they are net vision. Some of them have net vision. Some of them have a pointed laser. So those weapons are not hunting weapons. How can you use a 30 caliber weapon for hunting? The velocity of the weapon is so powerful, you cannot use it for hunting. Those are not hunting guns. Those are fully automatic military-style weapons. You mentioned intelligence. How did you know that the weapons were at the port? What type of intelligence? You know, like the journalists usually say, uh, they got information from reliable sources. So if we expose our intelligence, probably we might not get such intelligence again. So I will not be in the position now to give you those who are involved in handing down intelligence to us. Inspector General, as you know, Liberia will be voting in presidential election later this year. There's sometimes rising tension at this time of the year. Do you suspect anything? I cannot tell you what is the reason for which the weapons are brought in Liberia, but we are investigating to authenticate the motive behind the arms being brought to Liberia. Inspector General, thank you so much. It's a pleasure speaking with you. Happy New Year to you. Welcome. Thank you, too. Colonel Patrick Sudu is the Inspector General of the Liberian National Police. You are speaking with us from the capital, Monrovia. The exiled former Chief Justice of Equatoria Guinea is denying he is part of a group plotting to overthrow Equatorial Guinea President Teodoro Obiang Ngema Mbasogo. The world's longest serving leader, Juan Carlos Ondo Angu, says the government is trying to discredit him because of his commitment to the rule of law when he was Chief Justice. He testified recently in a Spanish court about a case involving the kidnapping and torture of two Spanish nationals of Equatorial Guinea origin and two others who were kidnapped from South Sudan in 2019 and extradited to Equatorial Guinea as part of an opposition movement in exile. Juan Carlos Andu Angu tells me he testified to shed light on what he calls the international network of kidnappings of political dissidents by the Equatorial Guinean government. As a result, he says, the government has chosen to discredit him and other witnesses. The communique recently published in the official media is clearly unfounded and tendentious and is justified solely by the desire to discredit me before the public opinion. In fact, as attest in the judgment in the case in question, handed down while I was still president of the Supreme Court, I have no connection whatsoever with the persons involved, nor with the facts constituting preparatory acts of the aforementioned attempt coup d'etat, the Equatorial Guinea Liberation Movement to which the intellectual authorship of the aforementioned plot was attributed, has denied any link with me in an official communique dated 17 February 2020. Why would the government accuse you of being part of a group that is trying to overthrow the government? My acknowledged commitment to the defense of the rule of law and judicial independence, while I was serving as president of the Supreme Court, 
was assimilated to a form of dissidence with the regime. At the same time, and above all, the accusation seeks to discredit my testimony before the Spanish justice system in relation to the lawsuit brought by the aforementioned movement for the liberation of Equatorial Guinea against Nicolas Obama Nchama, Minister of Security, Carmelo Ovon Obiang, Director of External Security, and Isaac Ngema Ondo, Director General of Presidential Security, for the crime of kidnapping for terrorist purposes and torture of two Spanish citizens. What do you know about an investigation by the Spanish judiciary into the alleged kidnapping and torture of two Spanish nationals in Equatorial Guinea? I have been asked in my capacity as a prisoner of the Supreme Court at the time to declare whether, in accordance with the laws in force and international law, the aforementioned Spanish citizens allegedly kidnapped in South Sudan had access to a fair trial with the due guarantees. Since the plaintiff claims that their conviction is based on self-incriminating testimony given under torture, and since numerous international organizations and observers have also denounced a systemic violation of the right to a fair trial, these included Amnesty International Human Rights Watch, the Clooney Foundation's Trial Watch Project, the American Bar Association, and observers. All the above international observers agreed in denouncing the prolonged and strict incommunicado detention of the defendants before the trial. They also denounced the lack of guarantees during the trial, the lack of impartiality, the lack of incriminating evidence based on self-incriminating confessions borrowed under torture and coercion. You said that you testified in the case of the two Spaniards. How would you describe your testimony? Did you corroborate the allegations of kidnapping and torture of them? As I stated above, my testimony consists of declaring whether the proceedings in this case were in accordance with the right to effective judicial protection governed by our fundamental law. As for the allegation of kidnapping and torture, it is based on the Spanish-Italian police investigation coordinated by Europol. You are a former Chief Justice of Equatorial Guinea, and I have known you for a number of years. You have always said that you did not want to talk publicly about developments in your country for fear that the government might go after your family. Why now did you decide to go public? The first to shed light on the international network of kidnapping of political dissidents, the regime has opted for the strategy of diplomatic coercion against a hypothetical conspiracy of Western governments, of which it claims that I would be the titer. For this reason, it has launched a campaign to discredit the witnesses like myself, a strategy to which he has already resorted in the French trial of the ill-gotten gains, which result in the attempted assassination of the witness Pedro Germán Tomo. Consequently, I have decided to speak out in order to refute the slanderous purpose against me and to reiterate my repudiation of any action or policy that undermines the rule of law. Thank you so much, sir. It's a pleasure speaking with you. Happy New Year. Thank you, Mr. Butti. Juan Carlos Ondo Angu is the exiled former Chief Justice of Equatorial Guinea. He was speaking with us from Paris, France. In Malawi, the lawyer representing Embato Anti-Corruption Bureau Director General Martha Chizuma says Chizuma views the allegations against her as a distraction to scare her away from fighting graft and malfeasance. Lawyer Martha Kakonde says Chizuma's treatment is a miscarriage of justice. Chizuma was arrested on December 6th and charged with committing an offense when she criticized the director of public prosecution, Stephen Kayuni, in a leaked audio of a phone discussion with a third party, Kayuni accused Chizuma of slandering him. A commission of inquiry set up by President Lastro Chakwera to investigate the circumstances surrounding Chizuma's arrest released its findings last week. It found that Chizuma may have done something wrong. Lawyer Kakonde tells me the commission failed to focus on the content of Chizuma's phone call, which had to do with corruption in Malawi. Indeed, the Commission of Inquiry has recommended that the director should be investigated with regard to the audio that leaked in January 2022. Well, for Ms. Chizuma, she feels that um, recommendation 
is misplaced and is not right because the issue was already tackled by the president in January 2022. Actually, at that particular time, he really uh, talked much about it and said that for her to be able to focus on uh, fighting corruption, then she needed to forge ahead and nothing should happen regarding that uh, leaked audio. It's surprising that uh, 12 months after the leaked audio, the commission is going ahead to make a recommendation that she should be investigated instead of uh, focusing on the real issues that were before the commission of inquiry to find out why she was arrested and the mode of arrest and how she was treated in the manner that she was treated. Because as you recall, she was arrested around 4 a.m. at dawn while she was sleeping at her house and she was bundled in a police car and taken out of the city at some police unit. Some people, including the Malawi Law Society, have said that the report released was missing some pages and they have been demanding that the entire report be released, including the missing pages. What does uh, the Honorable Chizuma think about this demand? Or does she feel that uh, the complete report has been released to her? Regarding the the release of the report, uh, indeed, at first the report was released uh, partly, but later on uh, we saw that the, the full report has been released. And at that particular time, my client was also concerned that only part of the report was released. And um, later on, uh, we saw that the full report has been released and she was glad about it much as she also has issues with the report because uh, reading uh, through the report, you note that her full evidence is not there. It has not been captured. Most of it has been left out. And uh, she's been, uh, she's very concerned about that because it's like uh, her side of story has not been recorded in the report and uh, put out to the president who uh, instituted the inquiry. With regard to the motive or the aim of um, the audio, I think it's meant at distracting uh, Ms. Chizuma. Does Honorable Chizuma believe the allegations against her are in the interest of fighting corruption in Malawi or a distraction? The allegations against Ms. Chizuma are a clear distraction. They are not aimed at helping fighting corruption in Malawi. We all can see that. Even the uh, society appreciates that all this is just to take her mind from her focus on fighting corruption. If you may recall, when they leaked audio, it was mentioned how corrupt all sectors of the Malawi society are. And no government institution is focusing on the important issues mentioned therein. Instead, they are all focusing on why the audio was released by her and saying that she may have committed an offence. But no one is tackling anything that she mentioned in that audio. The commission even failed to find the reason why she was recorded. And it even failed to interview the person who recorded her. This is a miscarriage of justice, to say the least. The whole machinations, including the uh, Commission of Inquiry, are aimed at scaring Ms. Chizuma in her quest to fight corruption in Malawi. And this is not acceptable. Martha Kakonde is the lawyer for Malawi Anti-Corruption Bureau Director General Martha Chizuma. She was speaking with us from the capital, Lilongwe. Last month, Busi Maisala became the first woman to form a political party in Eswatini, the Swazi First Democratic Front Party. Yesterday, Sunday, she and other pro-democracy groups attended the funeral of the party's Deputy Secretary General, Musi Mema. Maisala tells me her party's Deputy Secretary General was abducted from his home and killed. She says the party has suspicions and wants the government to find the killer or killers. Last week, on Tuesday, around 7, four men went to his home in the rural areas and abducted him in front of the kids. He shouted, uh, but no one helped him, so they, they put him in the car. With them, they drove away in front of the family. They alerted me. I put on social media and the newspapers that she's been abducted and we don't know. But they do have the, the make of the car. So we put everywhere. We tried calling the police to see if he has been taken to maybe 
for questioning because of the political involvement. That's what we thought. We called the whole night. I was calling everywhere to check if he was taken to court for anything or jail or something, but we couldn't find him. In the morning, when we woke up, uh, again, I was waiting to hear news. We're still trying and calling. And then I received a call that uh, his body has been found. Busi, you say you suspect he was abducted. He was taken. He was taken in front of his family by four men. So you said you believe the state might have abducted him. Do you have any reason to think that way? Yes, because they came straight to the home. He was just at home. And these people acted like they needed some water. They had a problem with their car. So when the kids were trying to get water for them, because the car parked by the gate, when he was walking there, they just grabbed him. Four men grabbed him and threw him into their car and drove away in front of the family. That was Busi Mayisala, founder and president of the Swazi's First Democratic Front, Eswatini's first female-led political party. She was speaking with me from Eswatini's capital, Mbabane. It's time now for Daybreak Africa Sports, and here is something Omale in Abuja, Nigeria. A very good Monday morning to you, something. Good Monday morning to you too, James. We begin the sports in North Africa, where the Tunisian Handball Federation on Sunday announced the final list of players to take part in the Men's World Handball Championship, co-hosted by Poland and Sweden, which begins from January 11th to the 29th. Coach Patrick Kazar named Asil Namil, Mahid Habui, Yassin Belgade, Osama Bouhami among 18 players who will aim for the title. In the preliminary round of the Men's World Handball Championship 2023, Tunisia will play in Group H alongside Denmark, Belgium and Bahrain. In cricket news, the third and final test between Australia and South Africa ended in a draw at the Sydney Cricket Ground on Sunday. The South Africans were able to bat out for a draw on the final day to deny Australia a series sweep in the three-test series. The South Africans were 105 for two in their second earnings when Australia captain Pat Cummins settled for a draw with five overs left. After a forgettable series for the visitors, South African coach Malibongwe Makweta was pleased with the resistance shown by his side on day five at the SCG and praised their efforts in grinding out a draw. We lost to a better team, more skilled, uh, more experienced. And today to come out and fight the way we did um, was quite encouraging. Um, from the start, we knew we had to bat way above our average to compete. And probably the conditions in the first test challenged us there. And the second test, we were pretty disappointed with our efforts. And to come here and show a glimpse of what we have was quite encouraging. And now to Taekwondo, where Egypt is preparing to host three international Taekwondo championships in February in what is reported to be a first for the continent. The board of directors of the Egyptian Taekwondo Federation, headed by Chancellor Mohamed Mustafa, has attracted three competitions in the space of one week next month. The first event in the GL-classified Egypt International Championship is due to be held from February 11th to the 15th. In basketball news, the FIBA Afro Can, a new national team competition aimed for players based on the continent of Africa, is set to return for the first time since 2019. The Afro Can qualifiers are expected to run in February for nations that won't compete in the World Cup African qualifiers. The following teams qualified for the second edition of the FIBA Afro Can by virtue of their reaching the semi finals of the last edition that held in Bamako, Mali. They are DR Congo as champions. Kenya, who were runners up, Angola, who were in third place, and Morocco, who took the fourth position. And that's it on this Monday's edition of Daybreak Africa Sports. I am Samson Omale in Abuja, Nigeria. It's back to you, James, in Washington. Thank you, Samson. Have a good Monday. And that's it for this Monday, January 9th edition of Daybreak Africa. We thank you for beginning your week with us. For more African news and features, visit our website at voaafrica.com. Connect with us on all social media platforms.